Hi, everybody. It's Professor Mitchell. Uh, we're continuing with chapter two today, and you'll be happy to hear that um, I'm pretty sure the rest of the videos in chapter two are going to be pretty short. Uh, so this next one is on section 2.3, which is displaying qualitative data. Uh, you'll recall that in section 2.2, we talked about displaying quantitative data. Uh, remember that qualitative data are values that are categorical. They can be measured on the nominal or ordinal uh, scale. So normally these describe characteristics, for example, gender or level of education. Now, I do notice that uh, your textbook, the textbook that this course is based on, uh, is very, very into Excel, uh, which is great because I am too. Uh, a lot of the examples that they show here are very oriented around Excel. So I'm gonna be on the lookout for that in the future. If I feel that they don't do a good enough uh, job explaining you know, just how to do something on paper, uh, then of course I will you know, explain that for you. I think these next couple of sections are simple enough that uh, you'll get the idea uh, just from what we have here. So it does talk, uh, it does talk about how to do these in Excel. Uh, the first type of display that we're going to talk about is a frequency distribution. Remember that you can also do those to display quantitative data. Frequency distributions help display qualitative data by indicating the number of occurrences of various categories. Now, if you're a person who likes Excel, uh, and if you're not, even if you're not, I hope to get you to that point uh, by the end of the semester. I, I think I mentioned before that I tend to use Excel a lot and encourage you to use it uh, a little bit later in the semester. I don't think it's quite you know so necessary for this. Uh, but you can pretty easily, I've done it myself, use Excel's count if function to count the number of values matching a category label. So I'm not going to go into all the details. You can see them here. Uh, what I really want to focus on here is this. So let's say that I had a list of grades and this list must continue down Oh, well, you see it right there. It starts in row two, goes down to row seven, and then they've hidden rows uh, eight through 29, okay? Uh, but there's a list of grades here. So the frequency distribution for qualitative data uh, just looks like what you see here. So you go through and you count how many occurrences of each grade there are. Uh, and it's not difficult to do that by hand as long as the set of data is not you know, huge. And it turns out in this set of data, there are seven A's, 14 B's, six C's, one D, and two F's. Uh, not too bad. I'd call that a pretty successful semester. Um, then over here, you can do the relative frequency. Remember the way that works is, uh, in this case, seven divided by 30. So about 23.3% of the class got A's. 14 divided by 30 is about 0.467. So nearly 47% of the class got B's. Six divided by 30 is 0.2, 20% got C's, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're interested in tinkering with Excel, uh, what I would encourage you to do is pause the video and just kind of look at this you know, what you see up here. I'll, maybe I'll just explain it a little bit. Uh, and they are really getting kind of fancy with their Excel usage here. So uh, the way this works, this is the COUNTIF function. The COUNTIF function takes two uh, inputs. The first one is a range of data. You know what, don't worry about these dollar signs right now, that's a little advanced for what we need. So just focus on A2 through A31 uh, because that's where all the grades are. So what it's telling Excel to do is to count in the range of data from A2 to A31, every occurrence that matches what's in cell C2, which is A, all right? And uh, when you do that, if you press enter, it's going to say seven. 
which means there are seven A's in this column, okay? And then over here, it's taking uh, the relative frequency. So there will be a number in here, it'll be a seven. And then down here, it's just adding all of the values in these five cells. So that's gonna come up with 30, okay? And I think that's about all I'll say about Excel right now. Uh, remember the cumulative relative frequency. Uh, so in this case, the way that would work is how many students got that letter grade or better, okay? So obviously an A or better just means an A, all right? So that's still 23.3%. But a B or better would mean an A or a B, right? So you would do 0.233 plus 0.467, and that would give you 0.7. And then how many students got a C or better? In other words, how many passed? 0.7 plus 0.2 is 0.9, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. It's pretty simple. Again, very easy to do these on paper as long as the uh, set of data is not that big. I don't like to do it if, there's, uh, if the set of data is more than about 50. All right, next we have bar charts. Bar charts are very similar to histograms. Bar charts are a good tool for displaying qualitative data that have been organized in categories. Uh, so they're going to use the same example, and again, they're explaining how to do it on Excel, but again, it's very easy to do them on paper. So let's just fast forward to the next slide. Uh, a bar chart can be done as a vertical bar chart or a horizontal bar chart. Uh, notice that in a bar chart, there are gaps between the categories. It doesn't really make sense to stack them together. I mean, I guess you could. Um, but remember the concern in the last section when we were doing histograms, when you do a histogram, you definitely don't want to put gaps between the classes because uh, then somebody might think that there's an empty class between those two classes. With a bar chart, you don't have to worry about that. <clears throat> All right, so um, notice there is a horizontal axis where you have your categories and a vertical axis where you have your frequencies. It is very good practice, even when you're doing these on paper, uh, to give the bar chart a title and also to label the horizontal and the vertical axis so that if you hand this to somebody, say your boss, uh, they'll know exactly what they're looking at. Here are a couple of other kinds of bar charts. Clustered bar charts group several values side by side within the same category in a vertical direction. So as an example of that, they have uh, electric vehicles sold in 2016 and 2017. Uh, so, you know, the whole point of this is so that somebody can look at this in just a few seconds and kind of get the idea of, you know, the trends in electric vehicles sold. Uh, so that I, I see that of the four models they're talking about, the Tesla Model S, the Chevy Volt, the Nissan Leaf, and the Ford Fusion, um, whatever that is. I don't really know cars. <laughs> All right. um, in, every, in, in three out of the four cases, there were more models sold in 2017 than 2016. So that might be some evidence that um, electric vehicles are becoming more popular. The only one that went down, and it only went down just a little bit, is the Nissan Leaf. Okay. And then you have a stacked bar chart. Stacked bar charts group several values in a single column within the same category in a vertical direction. With this particular example, I think I would prefer the clustered bar chart. Uh, I think this is a little bit, well, actually, no, I take that back. I think it kind of depends on what uh, type of information you're trying to get across. This is what you would use if you were trying to tell somebody how many of each kind of vehicle was sold in that two year period. So in, in 2016, 2017 combined, it looks like there were about 5,700 
Tesla Model S has sold. I was just looking at my vertical axis label, um, wondering if this is in, you know, some other kind of unit, thousands or something. Uh, it doesn't say it is, so I have to assume 5,700 of those, about 3,500 of these, about 2,200 of these, and about the same number of these. Okay. So again, it depends on what type of information you're trying to get across. If you're trying to compare the two years, you should go with the clustered bar chart. If you're trying to uh, just communicate total sales for the two years combined, then I would go with the stacked bar chart. Uh, here we have the instructions on how to make these in Excel. And again, um, you know, if you're interested in looking at this, I'll let you pause the video. And, uh, you know, and there are a lot of great resources um, on this on, on YouTube and other places, Excel tutorials. Uh, again, I am not really going to uh, officially use Excel in this class until much later in the semester. All right, I'm thinking around chapter seven or eight. All right, next we have Pareto charts. Pareto charts are bar charts that show the frequency of the categories. Now, this is just an example. Let, let, me, let me put this in my own words, okay? I think of a Pareto chart as a bar chart that has the categories in descending order of frequency, all right? I'll say that again. A Pareto chart is a bar chart where the categories are in descending order of frequency. So. Uh, one example of how you could use that is categories that cause quality control problems. Uh, so now show the quality control problem categories in decreasing order with the most problematic categories first. Pareto charts also plot the cumulative relative frequency as a line on the chart, uh, which is called an OGIF. Remember, we talked about those in the last section. So here's an example. Reasons for and number of returns to QVC. So the number one reason is the product was defective. That accounts for 51.1% of returns. The second category is disappointed with the product. Um, so that accounts for roughly half of, of this category. And then uh, you have no longer wanted, late delivery, or other. Okay. Here are the raw frequencies up here. What do these add up to? It looks like 90. Looks like 90. All right. <clears throat> so uh, here is the bar chart. And again, we would call this a Pareto chart because they are in descending order of frequency. And here is the OGIV, which shows you the cumulative relative frequency. All right, so 75.6% of returns were because the product was dis, uh, defective or the customer was disappointed. 91.1% of returns were because defective, disappointed, or no longer wanted, et cetera, et cetera. All right, and they're referring you to the textbook for the Excel instructions, which I kind of like. <laughs> All right, uh, and you should be able to access that in the ebook. All right, and next we have pie charts. So everybody's seen a pie chart. All right, you see these in newspapers all the time, for example, or on the TV news, uh, really all over the place. <coughs> Pie charts are another excellent tool for comparing proportions for categorical data. Each segment of the pie represents the relative frequency of one category. So the requirements are all categories in the data set must be included in the pie. Use a pie chart to compare the relative sizes of all possible categories. And they suggest that bar charts are more useful when you want to highlight the actual data values. And when the classes combined don't form a whole. Um, another place you have to be very careful about not using pie charts is when some of the categories overlap. So there's one famous example, I wish I had it handy, where um, a certain cable news channel 
uh, asked people, this was back in like 2012, I think, um, which of the following candidates do you support getting the nomination for president? And I guess they didn't tell the people to pick only one. They, they might have just asked them, you know, which of these people would you support? So there are probably, you know, a bunch of people that said, well, I would support any of them or I would support these two. So what, what happened is they showed this pie chart where the categories added up to like 140% or something. And uh, it looked kind of ridiculous. So let's see. Uh, here we have the instructions for doing a pie chart in Excel. Uh, and let's see, the example they're going to use is uh, number of computers shipped by various manufacturers. So if I was going to do this as a bar chart, it would be a Pareto chart because they have these listed in descending order. Notice the other category, all right? So this will account for all computers, all right? So let's see what that looks like. Here we go. So this is what, a, uh, what your finished pie chart looks like. So the categories are color coded, which is not great for people who don't see color. So that's something you want to think about. Uh, you know, if you end up in a job where you have to make these things, it might be a better idea to, you know, um, well, do something like this. I don't know if you can see that you can, make one category stripes, make another one polka dots. Uh, that's another thing I see people do. So 24% of computers came from HP, 22% came from Lenovo, 16% came from Dell, et cetera, et cetera. All right, let's see. Yes, that's what I thought. That's the end of section 2.3. So we'll see you next time for 2.4.